As we continue in our Believe series, we are in the 10-week movement of Act Like Jesus. We're about midway through uh, this section. And um, part of acting like Jesus, we looked at last week, is being in biblical community. This week we're looking at knowing and utilizing your spiritual gifts. And so, uh, like I said before, there will be some tables at the back today. We'll culminate by giving you an opportunity to think about, if you're not already utilizing those gifts, um, where you could utilize the gifts that God has given you. If you don't know what your gift is, then you can go back there as well, and they can direct you to a a gifts assessment and inventory that will help you identify that. But as we do that, um, each week we have, in our Believe discussion series, we have a key question. The key question this week is, what gifts and skills has God given me to serve others? What gifts and skills has God given me to serve others? Now, uh, Romans 12, 4, and 6 is the key verse, and it says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. The key idea is, I know my spiritual gifts and I use them to fulfill God's purpose. Let's ask God just to uh, be with us now and open our hearts to the truth that he has about how we are to live. Father, we ask right now that you would speak to our hearts. We know and acknowledge through the singing of the song that there's no better place to be than right in your midst. And we do pray, Lord God, that you would set a fire that we can't contain, that we can't control, that would just well up within us, a fire that would transform us and those that we come into contact with. Holy Spirit of God, speak to us. Open our eyes to see where you have gifted us and where you have called us to serve, and may we follow you in obedience. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you guys saw or heard about um, the Alamo Bowl that happened in our city last night? Huh? Okay, well, I'm getting ready to tell you, so if you didn't watch it, you, you get caught up. Um, it was TCU versus Oregon. Now, now, I'm a Baylor fan, so I'm an arch enemy of TCU, but I'm a Big 12 fan when it comes to bowl games, okay, because Baylor's Big 12, and so I want Big 12 to have a good showing. Well, TCU, um, their starting quarterback, uh, you know, he, he performed a knucklehead move, um, and he got thrown in jail, and so he got suspended. So TCU has to go up against Oregon with a backup quarterback. It was 31 to nothing at halftime. Oregon was just trouncing TCU. So they go in at halftime, and um, the guy's name is Bram Kohlhausen. I had to look it up because I did, I had Kohlhausen. It's a big name. Bram Kohlhausen. He is a fifth year senior. He's never started a college football game before, all right? Fifth year senior, never started, finds out he's gonna play the day before because the starting quarterback gets thrown in jail and suspended. He's down 31 to nothing at halftime. And his coach tells him, Bram, your dad who passed away in November, he's looking down and he's gonna be really stoked when you come back and win this game. We are watching a movie together as a family and my son's following it on uh, his news feed and he goes, oh my goodness, TCU is getting ready to tie it up. So we switch over to the game and sure enough, with a few seconds left in the fourth quarter, TCU ties it up, they go into overtime. In the third overtime, Bram Kohlhausen runs around the end and goes in for the game winning touchdown. Pastor Jeff, what in the world does this have to do with spiritual gifts? Nothing, man, it's just so cool. (laughs) No, it it actually does, it actually does. He's a fifth year senior and he's never started a game. A fifth year senior's never started a game. What could happen in your life? What might happen in your life if you got off the sidelines and got into the game? You see, God has given every person who has professed faith in Jesus Christ the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
with the coming of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dispenses his gift to each person a gift for use in the body of Christ for the common good that strengthens the body and advances the gospel. What might it look like if we got off the sidelines and got into the game? The first thing we need to understand is that we need to know that we have a spiritual gift. In Acts chapter two, it's uh, the prophecy of Joel being uh, recast in Acts chapter two. And uh, Peter is preaching and he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. What you need to know and understand is that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit of God came upon people, but he didn't take up residence inside them perpetually or in an ongoing way. He came upon people, okay? Now, not everyone had this experience in the Old Testament, but the prophecy of Joel, which is now being reiterated in Acts chapter two, says there will come a day when the Holy Spirit will come upon and indwell. He's gonna pour out his spirits, sons and daughters, men and women, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will receive the deposit, Ephesians chapter one, the gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, in the Old Testament, there are gifts of the Holy Spirit. We see this in Exodus, when they're building the tabernacle, and um, God sends his Holy Spirit to come upon the, the craftsmen, the artisans, the, the builders and the weavers, and, and those that made all, all the instruments for the tabernacle. They were called gifts of the Spirit, that these were, their talents and their abilities were, were infused um, with the Holy Spirit so that they could accomplish the work. But this is a new day and a new era in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit comes and indwells and gives spiritual charismata gifts. So this unprecedented promise that God is up to a new thing and he's doing it in a no, new way and it's in the last days that this is going to happen. Well, you need to understand that there's the old covenant, there's the new covenant, um, there's the Jews, there's the Gentiles. This is a big thing to, to understand, that in the last days, that the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, will be hearing the gospel and responding. This is called the church age, and we're getting to respond right here and right now. I had something unique happen to me over the holidays, and um, we got invited to go to a Christmas party, and um, my kids are swimmers, and they've gone off to college, and they came back home, and some of their friends who were also swimmers, who had also gone off to college and come back home, one of the families says, let's have a get together. They happen to be Jewish. So there's three or four Jewish families. There's another uh, non-Jewish family besides us there, and we're all sitting at the table. And we're sitting at the table, and we're having, um, you know, just dinner and get together and talking, and um, one of the, the Jewish ladies turns to me, the, I'm the Gentile pastor guy, and says, so Jeff, what do you think about John Hagee's ministry? And I said, well, that's a pretty big question. Uh, which part of his ministry uh, did you want me to comment on? I got lots of thoughts. Um, and she said, you know, the, the, the Jewish thing. And I said, well, I, I think it's great. And she said, well, well, do you think Jews have to go back to Israel to, 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 you know, um, to be part of what God's gonna do? Because our rabbi says we're in the last days, we're in the Sabbath. I said, that's interesting. She goes, you know, I read that whole um, Left Behind series and it really got me thinking. And um, what do you think about all that? So I'm sitting here with three Jewish families that have invited me over, fielding a question that I did not raise. <laughs> I'm a theologian, all right? I've been to seminary, I've studied dispensationalism, which is right down, you know, Tim LaHaye was a dispensationalist who wrote the, those books. And she's asking me what I think. And so I had the opportunity to go from Abraham and says, you know, in the, the first covenant, it was established with Abraham. He was accredited righteousness because of his faith. Right? This was before the law. And they're all nodding. And I said, now, we believe the new covenant is established in Jesus' blood also by faith. And that in Isaiah, it testifies about how God will make all things new. And in Daniel, it tells about this period of time where the Gentiles are gonna fulfill the promise given to Abraham that all nations would be blessed through his seed. And now Gentiles are coming to faith and the world is being blessed because of the faith of, of Abraham and that 
not all Israel is Israel, but Israel is Israel by faith. And so Jesus is coming back, and we believe your first Messiah is the second coming of our Messiah. You just missed it the first time. I didn't say that part. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm giving this long theological answer, and the other non-Jewish person who's not a believer across from me goes, I just think everything that's going over there in Israel is all our fault. And I just went, okay, anyway. <laughs> and so, what does this have to do again with spiritual gifts? It's the same thing as the TCU football game. Nothing. But I'm convinced of this. I'm the only pastor, theologian, who was invited by three Jewish families over Christmas because their kids swim with my kids. And I'm the only one that got asked that question. I'm the only one in that table that could have answered that question. That God gave me spiritual gifts for a reason. He gave me the experiences and the circumstances and the, the giftedness that I have and that uniquely I was put in that position to just boom, fastball down the middle of the plate. Boom, baby. And that feels good. Here's the thing. If you're on the sidelines, you're a fifth year senior and you've never played a down. You've never gotten to experience it, what it means to live out the purpose for which you were created. You go to work and you're like, ugh, oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, I get this paycheck, oh well. They pay me to do this. I, get to, I, get, I do this so that I get to go spend my money the way I want to spend it. And that's the joy of your life, not your job, not what you get to do. Um, the joy of your life is to take the money, you know, you just kind of do it because you have to, but you get paid for it, and then you can go spend that on the things that you really enjoy. Newsflash. You were created for a purpose and you were given gifts by the Holy Spirit for a reason. To participate with God in the purpose for which he created you, in advancing the kingdom of God, and participating in strengthening the body of Christ. And until you get on that game plan, you will never experience it's halftime, son. You're down 31 points. Your father in heaven is looking down, and isn't he going to be elated when he sees you bring this team back? Second thing scripture says, in Romans chapter 12, three through eight, it says, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. But rather, think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, all these members do not have the same function. So in Christ, those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, we, though we are many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Turn to the person next to you and say, you belong to me. Like, Pastor Jeff, I don't even know this person. This is awkward. <laughs> if this person is a follower of Jesus Christ, if they've accepted Christ as their Savior, they're your brother and sister in Christ. They're your family member. You are individually members of the same body. Even though you may have different functions, you belong to one another. And then he goes on to say, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift's prophesying, prophesying then prophesy. If it's serving, then serve. It's teaching, then teach. Whatever gift you've given, do it, he says. Now in Ephesians 4, there's another uh, gifts list. In Ephesians 4, verse 7, it says, to each one of us, to each one of us individually. You got that part so far? Grace has been given. Charismata has been given as Christ has apportioned it, as Christ has given it out. Okay, now let's skip down to verse 11 because Paul does a little parenthetical that's interesting but not contextually important right now. In verse 11, it was he who gave, Christ who gave, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. To each one, we have been given. All right, say I had a bag of M&Ms. 
to each one I am going to give an M&M, right? That means every one of you individually. Now, there's a limited number of M&Ms, all right? So there's red ones. To each one he gave a blue, green, yellow, brown. Well, orange too, but, but I'm only gonna use five for this. Orange may be your favorite. Okay, it can be orange, I don't care. But there's only five in this other example. Okay, so each one he gives, some he gave to be apostles. Now, there's a role of an apostle and there's the office of apostle. All right, there's only 12 apostles, okay? They have that office, it's theirs, theirs alone. But there's a role um, that some can be, that is apostolic, we'll talk about that in a moment. Some he gave to be prophets, Again, um, we'll talk about that in a second. Some pastors, uh, evangelists, teachers. Sorry for my penmanship, you guys. I've worked on it and that's as good as it's getting for now. I'm a work in progress. Okay, so what it says in Ephesians 4 is he has given to each one, one of these, all right, and there's other spiritual gifts inventories in scripture. So there's First Corinthians, there's the Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, there's the First Peter. So, th- so there's other, these other lists, and so we try to figure this out. Well, in Ephesians 2, it says that we are being built into one house, all right, and Jesus Christ is the foundation, okay? Jesus is the foundation of the building, and we, the church, are being built into one temple or one household, if you will. And what we've come to understand is in this five-fold ministry is that each one of us has a particular um, temperament or role, if you will, a wiring, I would say. All right, and apostles, if you follow this line of reasoning, apostles are not the the office of apostle, but they have the wiring of apostle, an apostolic wiring all right, is somebody who, who's, who's a, a, a trailblazer. They're a go-getter, they're a pace setter. They're what we call early adopters, right? How many of you still have um, a landline in your house? Okay, you're not early adopters. <laughs> How many of you got rid of your landline over eight or nine years ago? Okay, you guys are early adopters. You're the type of people that are like, yeah, let's get rid of that. We don't need that anymore. We get VOIP and we can do all this kind of stuff. The technology just keeps advancing, all right? Apostles are the, are the early adopters. They're the ones forging into the, into the wilderness, setting up beachheads, trying stuff new. They're going and, 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 and they're taking uh, the message with them to places yet unknown and unreached. Prophets are the thus saith the Lord type people which is to differentiate from prophetic, meaning I have a word from the Lord that no one's ever uh, heard before. Um, th- th- there, there is a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom, but that is not to be written down into scripture, it's okay? It's not a, a prophecy per se. It's pr- a prophet temperament. A prophet temperament is the thus saith the Lord type personality. They're the type of person that, so if you wanna know, do these genes make my uh, rear look big? Um, if you really wanna know that, ask the prophet. Because he's going to tell you. He's not going to water it down. He's going, yeah, looks huge. <laughs> All right, prophet just tells it like it is. They're not afraid to say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You know what? I'm not, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to thus say it the Lord. Lord says, da, 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 da. All right. The, the pastors are the, are the, the, the shepherds. They're the people that come alongside. They're, when you're hurting, they're there for you. They, they show up with the meal. They come by your, your office and, 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 and love on you and listen. They take the time to spend with you. They're the, they're the Dave Galbraiths of the world that just never, never uh, weary with being with you, helping, uh, ministering, come alongside. Uh, th- that's just their wiring. The evangelist, they're, they're the salesman. They're like, oh, have you gotten one of these yet? Dude, you've got to get one of these. This is awesome. And then the next week you see them, and they're on with something else. They're like, oh, have you seen this? You've got to try this. 
Um, they're, 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 they're pitching and selling and just, this is what you need to know. This is what you must hear. This is what you must have. And then the teachers are the kind of people that make those things complex simple. If you're in Northside school system and you have to go to a tutor, your teacher's not a teacher, your tutor is. Got it? Teachers, the tutors, you go to them because the tutor can make that which is complex simple. And all the teachers are going out there, well, Pastor Jeff, really, we are teachers. We just don't have enough time with every individual student. You get what I'm saying. It's just an analogy. Don't, don't take it personally. All right? Um, this was my prophetic thing just coming out. I'm just telling it like it is. Okay. So you, you get what I'm saying. And, and again, I caveat that because I realize sometimes it's not about, um, not that you're a good teacher. It's just you don't have time. I got it. All right. Whew. Saved myself from answering some email. So what am I saying? I'm saying there's only one you. Last year at this time, I was depressed. Clinically depressed, on medication, and my elders were having a meeting because um, they didn't know what to do with me. And four, uh, three of the four elders had never been depressed before. They'd never experienced depression, and so they're trying to fix me. Well, have you tried this? Well, have you done this? Well, have you done this? And in a loving way, they were really trying to minister to me. And so I filtered all that and said, they're just trying to help. They're doing, they're doing all they know to do. But in that meeting, one of my elders, Tim Clark, who happens to have a unique wiring. Tim's kind of a prophet, prophet personality. He just says things the way they are. He's not afraid to say it. But he's also a gentle, sensitive spirit. He's got an artist uh, temperament as well. You know, he's a guy who plays music and he's a guy who mixes the sound back there and he's got this little bit of, 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 of that, that sensitivity thing going as well. And so he hears what's going on, but he's also got that prophet temperament. And so just in the middle of the meeting, he goes, you guys stop, stop. You're not helping. He goes, I've been depressed. I know where he is. And the best thing we can do is to come alongside of him and just be there for him. Give him the space that he needs and be there for him. None of this stuff is gonna help him. Tim was the only person in that room that from a place of spiritual gifting, from a place of experience, Right time, right place, everything. God used him in a powerful way to help me be here today. Now listen, it's halftime. We're down by 31. You're a fifth year senior and you've never played. We need you. The father is looking down. We can win this thing. Second thing I want you to see is not only do you have to know your gift, you have to use your gift. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says there, this Romans 12 is, is the passage we've been in primarily. It starts off this way. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The context of which he goes into verse 7, talking about spiritual gift, comes out of verse 1 and 2. He's talking about using your spiritual gift, serving God, and he says, look, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. There's only one you. You need to identify with how God has designed you versus what the world tells you. There's only one you. Quit trying to be someone else. Now, he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Your gift, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Your gift of worship is not sitting out here singing songs. Your gift of worship is utilizing your spiritual gift in the body of Christ to strengthen the body of Christ to advance the kingdom of God. And you can use your gift within the walls of the church, outside the walls of the church, but you gotta know what your gift is and you gotta put your gift into play. And that is your gift of worship. Living sacrifices serve. They crucify their flesh. They lay down their own will and their desire. Oh, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to wait, wait, wait. All right, take the nail, nail yourself to the cross, living sacrifice. It's your holy and acceptable gift to God. I lay myself down and I serve you, Lord. 
and I serve based on the giftedness that you have given me. You see, if your gift is unused, it's lying dormant like a fifth year senior who's never played. But if your gift is abused, then it lacks focus. You use all your strengths, you use all your skills, you use all your giftedness either for the world's benefit or for your own personal benefit. If it's the world's benefit, you're over there working at that, that massive corporation. They don't know you, they will never remember you, you're just a number. And they're trying to drain you and you just want to ring the bell. If I could just get another raise, then I'll feel significant about myself. I'll be someone good and important. No, you won't. They don't care about you. I mean, you know, managers, just take it with a grin salt. Here's the thing, it doesn't mean that's a bad job. It just, you can't do that job well until you understand I'm in this place for a reason and the gifts that I have are here for a reason and it, it doesn't happen to be programming this computer. I program this computer to get a paycheck but I program this computer based on my giftedness and calling for the kingdom of God and all these people around here are my ministry and my opportunity. And you'll never experience the joy of God until you begin to look at your life through that lens because there's a difference between an occupation and a vocation. An occupation keeps you busy. A vocation is from the word voce, calling. God purposed and designed you. He is the creator God who made you. And the one who made you knows the purpose for your life. And until you get on the same page as the creator, you're gonna go to dead end job after dead end job trying to please manager after manager and you're gonna come up short and empty because you're abusing the gift that God has given you. You're using it for the world. If you're using it for yourself, then what you're doing is you're taking your gifts and your abilities and you're trying to make a pile of cash that you can go out and spend it the way that you wanna spend it and live your life. Again, you will wind up empty with a lot of toys. Those things will only make you happy like they make a four-year-old happy after Christmas. In one month time, those toys that you gave someone eight and under probably will be discarded or forgotten. And that's the way your toys will be until you identify with your purpose and your reason and why God has gifted you and wired you the way he has. Romans 12, six says, we've been given these different gifts and each grace, uh, according to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, prophesy, serving, serve, if it's faith, then, then exercise it. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouragement, then encourage. If it's giving, then give generously. Whatever you got, do it. Whatever you've got, do it. There's only one you, and the body needs you. In 1 Corinthians 12, four and seven, it says there are different kinds of gift, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service. So it says gifts, service, workings. You could add the Old Testament list of artisans and craftsmanship. This is not scientific, all right? We, we do the best we can by taking all the different passages of scripture. And so if, you, if you've got a spiritual gift, say you've got a spiritual gift of encouragement and the temperament of an apostle. Well, you're gonna do that differently than the person who has the, the, the temperament of apostle with, with the, the gift of um, leadership, all right? You're just gonna go about it differently. There's no one wired like you in the context that you're in. Nobody could have been at that party that I was at, talking to the people that I was talking to, the way that I was talking to them, fielding the question. God just uniquely gave me that opportunity. And he's uniquely giving you opportunities all the time. But if you don't know your gifts and you don't know your wiring and you don't lean into that, this is who I am and what I'm designed for, then you'll miss those opportunities. You're a unique gift and a unique blessing. Last year, a friend of mine picked up the phone he said, hey, can I take you to lunch? Lives in my neighborhood and we went to lunch and he's a quiet person. Probably wouldn't say he's using his gifts. Real quiet, behind the scenes temperament. Takes me to lunch and just listens to me as I pour out my heart. 
doesn't say anything profound, doesn't necessarily do anything significant in the sense of that. But as I watched him, because I've known him so long, I would say his gifts are faith, giving, probably serving. And in the course of that lunch together, he was being a faithful friend. And they've been with us 15, 16, 17 years. Faithful, never wavering in friendship. He was giving me the gift of his time as well as many gifts that they just continue to pour out to let us know and encourage us. And he was serving me without some profound wisdom, without some kind of big, just loving me. He probably went on with his day, not thinking, not realizing, not cognizant of the fact that God was using him through his giftedness in a very powerful way in my life. But I recognized it. I recognized him, his role in my life, and the gifts that God was using in my life. And I am grateful. When we began to look at one another through the lens of Christ, through the gifting of the Holy Spirit, and realize that each one of us has a unique calling in order to be a unique blessing to those around us, so that the kingdom of God can advance. When we do that, we'll set records and change the world. But right now, it's halftime. And we're down 31 to nothing. And every one of you who's on the sideline, we need you. The Father's looking down, and he's gonna be delighted when we win this thing. But we need you. As we close, there's a list in your bulletin, an opportunity to sign up, and if that doesn't do it, we'll find something, a place for you to serve, to get in the game, and experience the joy for which Christ created you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've called us. We thank you that you've gifted us, that you, the creator, have a plan for your creation that is beyond what we can imagine. So Lord, find us faithful and obedient and ready to be living sacrifices, ready to serve you, to be members of the body in a way that would be pleasing to you and beneficial to others. Find us faithful today in Christ's name. Amen.